Good morning. Good to see you on this holiday weekend. Good to be in the house of the Lord together. Let's prepare our hearts to worship our Lord. We're going to start by singing every step. Let's stand together. Let's worship the Lord. Let's sing to the glory of our God. I can sing with my whole heart, I have all I need. Jesus, my Savior, my joy is complete. Onward to glory, yet here I will wait. I will trust in Christ every step I take. I am sure of your promise to guide me each day. Though some may oppose me, I won't be ashamed. Whatever I face, Lord, it won't be in vain. I will trust in Christ every step I take. For all of my days, I will live for your glory, running with courage and faith. The prize of my journey, the joy of salvation to me. My King face to face So I'm looking to Jesus, perfecter of faith My heart set on heaven where treasure awaits I'll run with endurance to finish the race I will trust in Christ every step I take all of my days I will live for your glory, running with courage and faith. The prize of my journey, the joy of salvation to me, my King face to face. I will, I will rejoice, whatever comes my way, God, you're faithful to save. to save I will I will rejoice I know that God is with me always. always I will I will rejoice whatever comes my way God you're faithful to save I will I will rejoice I know that God is with me always for all of my days I will live for your glory Running with courage and faith The prize of my journey The joy of salvation To meet my King face to face To meet my King face to face To meet my King face to face Did anybody eat too much? <laughs> There's a few that admit to it. A few. Our text this morning is once again from 1 Timothy chapter 5. We've been looking at this fifth chapter for a few weeks now. And this morning we're going to look at the verses beginning at 17 to the very end, verse 25. It does deal with money. And some of you may be thinking, well, why is Pastor speaking about money? Well, we have a business meeting afterwards. Maybe that's why. <laughs> no, that's not why. <laughs> no. uh, money is a crucial part of uh, any institution, certainly the family, but certainly the family of God as well, the church. Uh, there are some churches that speak about money only when it lacks money. And, well, m maybe that's too late. You should talk about money before you're lacking it. Some churches talk about money all the time. It makes people say, well, you know, that's all they want is more money, more money, more money. Some people even keep making blessings. If you give more, God's going to bless you more, therefore give more. Yeah. And we seldom talk about money. Um, but we do talk about money when it's in, it's in the text. And it's in the text this morning. It's there. And so 
we're speaking about it. And now, I, I, I'll warn you now, the sermon is going to sound very self-serving. It's almost embarrassing. Okay? Um, you'll see what I mean in a few moments. But I, I'm just preaching from what the text says. This is where we have landed. Uh, again, here we are speaking about money. There's a church business meeting. And it's kind of bad planning on my end, but that's the way it landed. It has nothing to do with our meeting later this afternoon. If you take a look at 1 Timothy chapter 5, beginning at verse 17, you know what? Let me read it to you, and then we'll talk about it. How's that? Does that help? 1 Timothy 5, 17, Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scriptures say, You shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. Do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all so that the rest may stand in fear. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels, I charge you to keep these rules without prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. Do not be hasty in laying on of hands, nor take part in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. The sins of some are conspicuous, going before them in judgment, but the sins of others appear later. So also good works are conspicuous, and even those that are not can re cannot remain hidden. Well, you, were, you will recall that in 1 Timothy chapter 5, we've taken a look at how to treat others. You'll recall that just a couple of weeks ago. How to treat each other within the household of God. And then last week, we took a look at how to treat widows or how to treat people who are in need in our midst. And you'll remember who has the first priority? The family, right? Family. And then, of course, the church has a responsibility of taking care of others who are in need. And as I mentioned last week, unfortunately, much of that is now taking care of the government, which makes the church sort of, you know, cross their arms and say, well, there's not much more I can do. But there is. And now lastly, beginning here at verse 17, we see here how to compensate the pastor, how to protect the pastor, how to correct the pastor, and how to select your pastor. And some of you may be saying, well, we have a pastor. Why is he preaching this? Well, because it's part of the text. And we should understand what Timothy was saying to the, to, to uh, rather what Paul was saying to Timothy. Remember, this is all about how to build the church of Christ. And these are principles we need to apply if we're going to build the church of Christ properly. And much of the trouble churches face uh, today is because they have simply ignored these instructions. And I tell you, many churches have many, many severe problems. I thank the Lord for the small amount of issues we face. Oh, everything's not perfect here either. But I thank the Lord for the few problems we do have. Our God has blessed us. And a big part of that is because we look to keep to the text. We keep our fingers in the text. We keep our noses in the text, reading and studying and certainly trying to apply it. But as I said before, uh, this is going to sound a bit self-serving, but it is important nonetheless. And keep in mind, my friends, that the church will never rise higher than her leaders. That is to say that whatever you see behind the pulpit is going to be reflected in the sanctuary. So it is important that we have the proper leaders within the household of God. That's true for every church, big or small. The church is never going to rise higher than her leaders. And so we must find leaders who will reflect the word of God because the church will reflect her leaders. And so I have just a few points for you this morning, four all together. They're rather simple. But once again, I want you to see that the Word of God does speak to these matters. These are not just things we come up with. 
Uh, these are codified in the Word of God. These are principles that we need to carry out. We need to see them played out in the daily life of the church. And here's the first one. We see in verses 17 and 18 how to compensate your pastor. How to compensate your pastor. Look there, verses 17 and 18. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. The truth is, is that the pastorate is a rather dangerous calling. Uh, dangerous because the pastor has to answer to God for how and what he teaches. Look at James chapter 3, verse 1. I'll read it to you if it's not on the wall. James 3, 1 reads this way. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers. And here's why. For you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Those who teach the word of God will be judged more strictly than those who listen to the preaching, the teaching of the word of God. That should make every teacher more alert. But nonetheless, as dangerous as it may be, the pastorate is indeed a high calling as well. To serve as an elder in a household of God is a high calling. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, a couple chapters backwards, you'll recall, it says, if anyone aspires to the office of overseer, elder, pastor, he desires a noble task. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7, reads this way, Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God, consider the outcome of their way of life, and imitate their faith. Same chapter, verse 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over you, not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. So it's an honorable position as well. And unfortunately, in our culture today, the role of a pastor is certainly not as honored as it used to be in society, but not even within the church is it so honorable. Um, and some of it has to do with the failures of the pastor. How many times have we heard of the moral failure or the doctrinal failure of pastors? Some of them very well known, and some of them not so well known. But no matter how we respond to the position within the church, it remains a high calling to serve vocationally in the household of God. It's a high calling. It's an honorable calling. And here Paul gives instructions on how to treat your pastor. How to treat your pastor. And let me say, folks, you've treated me very well. Okay, I'm very glad to be your pastor. And here Paul gives instructions on how to build the church of God. Regarding, first of all, the elder who rules well. The pastor who rules well. Elder is his title. Pastor is what he does. Here we see in verse 17, regarding the elder who rules well, I want to emphasize the one who is doing it properly, the one who is faithful to his calling, just as we saw last week, the widow who is faithful to her calling, well here, the pastor who is faithful to his calling, that pastor is worthy of double honor. Double honor. His position is already honorable, but now he should be honored further even. And it's not here speaking about a gift. You should give him a gift, honor him doubly, no, it's talking about what he deserves. Not a gift, but what he's earned. Uh, the honor here is a reference to financial remuneration, money. Take a look at verse 18. In a few moments, you'll see what I mean. Now, it's not saying here that the pastor deserves double pay. That's not what it's saying. It's referring to the fact that the Pastor deserves double in the sense that it is ample. It is enough. Ample. That is, those who live to preach the gospel or to be paid to preach the gospel. This is the pastor's vocation. The very end of verse 17 tells us that 
this is especially true of those who labor in preaching and teaching. Emphasis there on labor. Um, the idea here is that he exhausts himself. There, there's a sense of fatigue because he's working so hard at teaching, proclaiming the scriptures. Uh, it's also here describing an excellency uh, to his work. He is devoted to the task of pastoring. In other words, he strives on behalf of his congregation. And, and it contrasts significantly with, with those who are not ruling well. Remember at the beginning it said, for those who rule well, what a contrast then of, with those who do not rule well. See, that's the pastor's job. And often people wonder, what in the world does he do all week? Sometimes somebody asks. And I would invite you to come and just spend the day with me and you'll get a better idea. You may be bored out of your mind, but you'll see there's plenty to do. I have yet to see a day in which I could say I got everything done. I'm not a slow worker. But there is so much to do, so much to be said, so much to pray about, so much to study, so much to answer. And I would invite you to come and see what is involved in pastoring. Some of you know. Some of you served in that capacity. And you know much too well. Well, verse 18, look there. There the Apostle Paul quotes not only from the Old Testament, but he quotes from the New Testament as well. He quotes from Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 10. Well, first the Old Testament. Look at what he says. It comes from Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 4. He says, do not muzzle the ox. Here's the principle. Pay the pastor amply. Pay the pastor what he deserves. And then he says, do not muzzle the ox. That is, don't muzzle the ox when it's treading out the grain. What would happen in those days, in order to separate the, the wheat from the chaff, is there would be a rocky area, and, and in the middle was a pole, and, and the oxen would be tied to the pole, and he would just go around in circles, and he would be stepping on all the sheaves of grain, and he would be separating the grain from the chaff, and, and also behind him would be the, the harvester, the, 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 the farmer. He would be on a board, like a sled, coming behind it, and that also, with friction, would separate the grain from the, the, the housing of the grain. And then when the wind would blow, the chaff would fly away, the heavier grain would stay behind. And a habit of some was to muzzle the ox. Why? Because on occasion, the ox would say, hey, there's food here. I'm stepping on all the food, and I'm hungry. And so the oxen would stop and begin to eat it. And so the farmer would say, hey, he's literally eating into my profits. And so he would muzzle the ox. And here the Lord says in Luke chapter, uh, rather Deuteronomy chapter 25, he says, don't muzzle the ox. In other words, it would be simply inhumane to not care for enough for the animal to allow the animal to eat while he works, while it works. He deserves to eat while working. Don't muzzle the ox. We see this a couple of times in the New Testament, by the way. I believe three times it's repeated in the New Testament. And then we see Paul quotes Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 10. Verse 7, Jesus Christ said, the worker is worthy of his wages. In other words, the worker has earned his compensation. Pay him what you owe him. Pay him what is due. And so you'll notice here, in speaking about the pastor being properly compensated, Paul says, you should take proper care of the animal, and you should take proper care of a servant. Deuteronomy 25, Luke chapter 10. And this is his conclusion. If an animal and a servant ought to be properly cared for, well, then shouldn't the minister of the household of God be properly cared for as well? And the conclusion, of course, is yes. If an animal is cared for properly, a servant is cared for properly, shouldn't the minister be cared for properly as well? Now, that's common sense for us here at Hope Church, but please understand that is not common sense in every church. 
in every church. I remember one fellow who one time said to me, um, he said, our job is to keep you humble. <laughs> and indeed, they tried very hard financially to keep me humble. I thank the Lord for how he's blessed us and you have blessed me and my family. So thank you. Thank you to the Lord and thank you to Hope Church. Well, there's the part on compensation of the pastor. If you take a look at the second uh, point in the, uh, verse 19, it, there we see how to protect the pastor. It's a strange thing, but those who are in leadership are often accused. They're often accused, sometimes falsely, sometimes in a very petty way. Accusations and allegations are common whenever there is authority, whenever there is leadership. Not just in a church, but especially in a church. And I sometimes think especially in a church because really, if you falsely accuse somebody in a church or you cause problems in a church, what happens to you? And if you don't like what happens to you, you just pick up and go somewhere else. Why? Because there's a church down the street. And that's what we do. That's not biblical, but that's what we do. There is in some people simply a desire to see leadership crash for whatever reason. They want to see leadership burn and simply because of maybe something happened to them in the past in the church. Or maybe they're just cynical or maybe they're just jealous maybe they just hate authority even spiritual authority maybe they just refuse to be under the leadership of anyone and they want to be the leader well, whatever the reason um, false accusations are rather common whenever there is leadership and here verse 19 it tells us how then to protect the pastor notice verse 19 it says do not admit, that is, do not accept or entertain a charge, an accusation against your pastor or hopefully in the Lord, Lord's will, pastors for us someday here in the future. Do, do not entertain a charge against your elders unless there's evidence presented by two or three witnesses. Two or three witnesses. The point here is that the church should protect the pastor by not letting the pastor be at the mercy of false and frivolous accusations. Now, the pastor is not immune from accusation, but neither should he be unduly exposed to accusations. There needs to be witnesses, witnesses who can agree to the claim. That is to say, one comment, one opinion is not enough. You need two, better yet, three. And th these are the rules here established for us by the Apostle Paul through the Holy Spirit and given to the church. How do you build your church? Well, this is one of the ways you build your church, protect your pastor. We see the same principle elsewhere in Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15. When accused of a crime, you, you need, when, when making an accusation of a crime, you need two or three witnesses. Paul does likewise in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 1. When people opposed him, he said, well, show me the witnesses. Give me two or three witnesses. The pastor ought to be protected. Which takes us then to the third point. How to correct your pastor. And you're thinking, wow, that was quick. This sermon is really going to fly. Well, let's slow down here. Verses 20 and 21. We see here how to correct your pastor. The pastor is not exempt from accusation. And the reason he's not exempt from accusation is because the pastor is not free from failure or from sin. And so there's times at which he needs to be corrected. The passage here realizes the frailty of pastors as men who face the same issues as any other man. There's no such thing as an infallible man of God. Every pastor struggles. So at verse 20 it says, As for those who persist in sin, for those who persist in sin, in other words, the sin issue has been addressed privately with him. You have spoken to him. But he continues to live outside of God's rule. 
Uh, literally, it reads, for those who are sinning, what must you do? Verse 20, rebuke him. That is, reprimand him. Convict him. Expose his conduct. Correct him. And what a contrast, though, from what we saw at the very beginning of chapter 5. Remember what it said, chapter 5, verse 1? Encourage the older man like a father. Do not rebuke him. Here it says, the pastor who continues to sin ought to be rebuked. He ought to be exposed. The leader of the church ought to be exposed to others. There it says, in the presence of all. You see it? Of all who? Of all other pastors. Maybe even all the rest of the church. He must be corrected. He must be corrected, why? For two reasons. One is, the character of God's leader needs to be commendable. It needs to reflect the pursuit of Jesus Christ. Re remember what God said, it's recorded in 1 Peter 1.16, Be holy because I am holy. Now that's a commentary for all of us here, but especially for the pastor. Be holy because I am holy. It doesn't mean you don't have to be holy. It means I must pursue it first if I'm to expect you to pursue it. I do expect you to pursue it because God expects you to pursue it, and you should expect me to pursue it first. Secondly, the character of the leader will be the standard for the church. Why must he be corrected? Because the character of the leader, of the pastor, is going to be the standard for the church. In other words, again, the church is always going to reflect the pulpit in terms of character. Hosea chapter 4 verse 9 says, like people, like priests. If the leaders in God's household are immoral, sinners, who persist in it, expect God's people to be the same way. And that's exactly what happened with the people of Israel. The church is no different. But there's a third reason, and it's listed here at verse 20. It says, rebuke him in public. It says, so that the rest may stand in fear. Why must the pastor be rebuked, corrected, even in public? So that the rest will stand in fear. You'll recall that when Jesus Christ was crucified outside the city gate, outside the city gate, it was so that those coming into this great city of Jerusalem would see Christ and the two thieves hanging there, and it was a commentary of what will happen to you if you dare break the law. It would strike fear on all those entering the city. Ooh, we better be careful. We better keep the law. Otherwise, that's going to be me hanging there. Well, we see the same principle here, but of course, without all the blood and the gore and even death. What we see here is that the sinning pastor ought to be reprimanded before his fellow peers who would then confirm his exposed guilt, yes, but would also be warned of doing likewise. And what a warning that is. Don't do what he did, because what's happening to him will happen to you. It was not intended to be a public shaming. Let's put him in front of everybody and make, make a spectacle out of him so he'll be truly embarrassed. No, no that's not the case here. It wasn't in order to instill in that the public, the other pastors, the fear of man, but rather it was to instill the fear of God. Verse 21 reads this way. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels, I charge you to keep these rules, these rules without prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. Reminds me of Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so by watching this man be exposed for his ongoing sinful practices, 
these men will develop a fear of God. The sinning pastor will experience the ramifications of sin for sure, and the others would witness the ramifications of sinning against God and against his church, and the fear of God would be instilled on these onlookers. This is one of the matters that I'm involved in when I go away to Chicago or Minnesota three, four times a year uh, with the Board of Ministerial Standing. Um, the board does help set direction and, and theological course for the Evangelical Free Church of America. Um, but w what I am doing primarily when I am away is simply exercising what we see here, working along of other pastors, about 15 altogether, trying to evaluate other pastors who have been accused of maybe theological failure or maybe moral failure. And if we find it to be true, if we find it to be true, we exercise discipline. We correct them. We expose them. We place them under discipline. They're removed from their position as pastors. And I can say that, that over the last four years, there hasn't been many, but there's been too many. And it's always heartbreaking. And as I read the accounts, I, I slide down in my chair, and I say to my wife, I can't believe these stories. She doesn't know the stories, but she sees them in my face. Pastors who simply frail spiritually, frail emotionally, may be exasperated by circumstances, whatever the case may be, they give in to temptation. And their sins are ruinous. And it affects their families. It affects their church. I do walk away from these meetings knowing, saying to myself, Oh Lord, protect me from such temptation. It instills the fear of God in me when I consider what can be what has happened with others. What we see here, my friends, is the humanness of any particular pastor. And unfortunately today, the frail humanity of pastors are, is much too common. Um, I don't think we're shocked anymore when we see a pastor fail morally? Isn't that a shame that we're not shocked? We're surprised, maybe, but we're never shocked. Maybe we have even grown cynical because of all the stories we read in various churches, in various denominations, of all the, the, the stories uh, of molestation and cheating and lying and so on and so on. Adultery is a big one. The church is plagued with leaders who lead with their words, but not with their lifestyles. And here the scriptures are saying this cannot be. Preachers who preach against greed, but are never content. Preachers who teach against immoral sensuality, but they have porn pornography habits. P uh, preachers who talk about being honest, but they cheat whenever they think they're not going to get caught. We need leaders who will lead with their words as well as with their lives. Now, no one man is going to be perfect, but he is to be a man. Remember what we read earlier on in chapter 2? He is to be a man on whom accusations will not stick, above reproach, one who lives wisely, one who is faithful to his wife, and has a good reputation both outside the church as well as inside the church. So that private sins, here we see, are to be made public, so that the public will fear the Lord. And then finally, number four, how to select your pastor. It would be wonderful if one day, even soon, we would have a second pastor here. Elders, once again, full-time elders who can work alongside of me and do the work of ministry. 
I pray for that regularly. I would ask you to join me in that prayer. How to select your pastor. Four simple points that we see here, verse 21, the second half of verse 21. First of all, you need to give careful attention to the instructions. Careful attention to the instructions. We, we tend to swerve away from the details, don't we? And, and we, we tend to opt for rules that are more pragmatic. Well, yes, we can do what the Bible says, but I have a quicker way. Let's do it this way, just for now. And what we discover is that when we become more pragmatic and we don't stick to what the Bible says, it is always hard to go back to what the Bible says. In fact, the damage is done. So stick to the rules. Here, Paul is, is very serious. He says, I charge you to keep these rules without prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. And notice here as well, that angels are going to have a part in our judgment, a part in the judgment of the church of Jesus Christ. Here Paul refers to doing all this before the eyes of God, of Jesus Christ, and the elect angels. And the elect angels are those chosen by God, which contrasts, of course, with fallen angels, which often we refer to as demons. Look at what Jude verse 6 reads. It says, and the angels who did not stay with their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling. They gave away their position of authority. They left their proper dwelling. He has kept them in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. There are fallen angels. But there are also those who have not fallen. Those are the elect angels chosen by God. And Paul identifies what these angels are to do. They are going to exercise authority over the church. So pay careful attention to the instructions. Stick to the word. I know there seems to be other ways to do it. It may be very much quicker, maybe easier. But my friends, stick to what the Bible says on how to select your pastors. Just stick to the word. Don't trim it. Don't shave it. Don't add to it. Just stick to the word. Number two, and do so without bias. Same verse says do not prejudge and do not show partiality. By prejudging, we're talking about no prejudice against the pastoral candidate or the person uh, who, who is being considered, as well as no personal preference. Well, I like him over him. I like this individual more than that. No, put all that aside. Do not prejudge him. Here are, here's what you need to consider. One is three C words, his creed, his calling, and his character. His creed is what does he believe and what is he going to teach you? His calling is how has God skilled him and enabled him to be a teacher of the word of God, a leader in the household of God, and of course his character. What kind of a person is he? And show no partiality. We see likewise here in the same verse. Do nothing based on favoritism. Uh, here it, it is saying do nothing based on what can tip the scales against or for that person? That's what the phrase actually means. Don't tip the scales. Show no partiality. I remember many years ago, about 35 years ago, there was a, a pastor looking to, to, um, to serve in a church where I was serving, and, and he was smaller than me. You're laughing. You think that's funny? <laughs> He had, he had a double platform. <laughs> and unfortunately, there was a, a small group of people said, oh, he can never be the pastor. He's too short. I get it. We like big. We like handsome. For many people, the ideal pastor would be somebody who's tall and handsome. But if you could only get one, we'll take one. Well, this fellow was neither tall nor handsome. At least I got one. <laughs> I 
And how unfortunate that he would actually be judged by his height and appearance instead of his calling, his character, and his creed. And fourth, do not select him hastily. Look at what it says there. Verse 22, do not be hasty in the laying on of hands. Don't be hasty in the laying on of hands. In other words, in ordaining him, ordination. Also, when I'm away those few times a year, I'm in the process of helping to ordain pastors. We read papers, we examine them. It's a rather intricate process. It, it is attainable, but it is difficult. And our, what we're looking to do is prepare them for ordination and then actually ordain them through their churches so that we will say, yes, you are a man able and called by God to serve in the church of God. It's a job I love to do and one I take very seriously. Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands. Laying on of hands signifies a sense of solidarity with that person saying, yes, I agree with you, I agree that God is calling you, and now I too am sending you out to do ministry, to be a minister of the gospel of Christ. Here the scriptures say, don't be too quick about it. First of all, you have to know the man. You have to know that person. You have to know his character. You have to know his creed. You have to know whether or not he's truly called. The elder is not supposed to be a successful businessman. It helps to have a good business mind, I suppose. But, but the Bible here is not saying, oh, if he does good in business, he'll probably be a good leader in a church too. He'll certainly be a good manager. That's not what the scriptures say. The scriptures do not say, call on successful businessmen to be your elders. It says, look at their character. Look at their creed. Look at their calling. God's enabling in their lives. Don't be so hasty. Otherwise, you'll find yourself, Timothy, participating in the sin of others. Look at what we see there, verse 22. The very, very end of verse 22. It says, don't take part in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. Keep yourself pure. Don't take part in the sins of others. That is to say, the unqualified elder, the unqualified pastor, is set up for failure. This is not a job you grow into. Yes, you can improve at it, but you must be already qualified in order to start working as a minister of the gospel of Christ in the church. Otherwise, that elder is certainly going to fail, and then once he fails, he's going to fall into sin. Or he will fall into sin, and therefore he will certainly fail. And here Paul tells uh, uh, Timothy, he says, don't be so hasty in picking your pastors because you are going to cause them to fail and you're, you're going to cause them to sin and you are not going to be guiltless about his sin. Don't participate in the sins of others. Be careful. Keep yourself pure. Don't be so hasty. Now, I, I find that very interesting because then Paul gives a parenthetical note to Timothy. Look at there, verse 23. And in some of your translations, it will actually be in parentheses. Now, apparently, young Timothy was doing his utmost to stay pure. A young pastor in the city of Ephesus, how difficult it must have been for him. He's doing his utmost. And, and apparently, in doing his utmost, he was very careful as to what habits he had. And here we see that he was very careful not to cause others to stumble by his habits. He did not want to cause anybody to fall, stumble spiritually, physically, or in any way because of his own life. He wanted to be an example to everyone else. And so he was being very careful. And so he stayed away from alcohol. As a means of making sure that nobody else said, well, Timothy drinks, therefore I'm going to drink. Timothy said, well, I don't drink, period. So you can't say Tim drinks, therefore I'm going to drink. 
an alcoholic can't say, well, you know, I see Pastor Tim drinking, therefore I should drink. Tim says, no, I'm going to do my utmost to remain pure. But here, Paul prescribes wine to Timothy, not to loosen him up, not to help him relax after a very long day, but rather, he says, Timothy, have a little wine for your stomach. It's medicinal. In fact, he says, no longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and for your frequent ailments. We're not talking here about watered-down wine, as some would suggest. There's no reason to even think that. But rather, we are seeing here that Paul is saying, have some wine for your stomach and for other ailments that you have. Don't drink just water. And, you know, if you talk to my wife, all you need in life is water. <laughs> water. That, that's going to be the solution to everything. Of course, I never get to see her because, well, she drinks a lot of water. And <laughs> where, is, where is my wife today? Yeah. Now, water has great value. No question about it. But in a day in which water was not necessarily pure, you could imagine the stomach problems it would cause. Wine, on the other hand, does have some medicinal value. We're told that it's an anti-inflammatory and that it boosts heart rhythm, that it's good for the heart. Here, Paul does say, have some wine, but notice it says, have a little wine. It will be good for you. And if you drink it wisely, Tim, it will not keep you from being impure. In other words, drunkenness is impurity. Drunkenness is a sin. You can't get away from that. But Timothy, if you drink it wisely, it will not keep you from being impure. Paul here is not advocating drinking. But, but you know, I think you know this, the Bible does not prohibit someone from drinking alcohol. It prohibits drunkenness. The problem is, is that one often leads to the other. Self-control is essential. The problem with alcohol is that it steals self-control little by little. And if you're not careful, soon you'll find that you have no self-control and you think you still are controlling it. But you're not. Everybody else sees that you're not, but you convince yourself that you are. The Bible prohibits drunkenness. But let me just add a little more to what we see here. We, we, we can't make a biblical argument. We cannot make a biblical argument for drinking based on this passage here. It, it, w w people say, well, you see, the Bible advocates drinking. No, the Bible here is saying Take it medicinally for your stomach, for your ailments. It's the same problem we have today with marijuana, isn't it? Uh, it went from being okay medicinally to now recreational. And I'm just waiting to see what it's going to produce here in New Jersey. Well, if alcohol is a problem, imagine marijuana. But we've taken that same way of thinking with drinking as we have with, alcohol, uh, with um, marijuana. It was okay medicinally, now it's okay recreationally. This here is neither a prohibition or an advocation of drinking alcohol. It's simply saying that there is, for you, Timothy, a value in a little wine. You'll notice that again and again, wine is mentioned in the New Testament as something that requires caution. Caution. And it's not just wine, it's whatever alcohol alcoholic beverage you may prefer. Here, Paul says, a little wine. Drink a little wine. Ephesians 5.18 says, do not be controlled by wine. Do not get drunk on wine. Instead, be filled by the Holy Spirit. Be controlled by God. When you're controlled by wine, you're not being controlled by God. Romans 14.21 says, it is not, it, it is, rather, it is good not to drink wine or to do anything by which your brother stumbles. 
The elder is to exercise self-control, and apparently not all were, and so Paul writes this in this letter to Timothy. Timothy is to be pure and care for himself. Did I say that was my last point last time? I was wrong. <laughs> there are verses 24 and 25. Brief but important nonetheless. The elder is to be selected with awareness. When selecting a pastor, understand that who he is really does matter. In some cases, what we see here, verses 24 and 25, in some cases, who he is is very obvious. In other cases, the truth is going to be revealed eventually. So look at verses 24 and 25. It says, The sins of some people are conspicuous, going before them to judgment, but the sins of others appear later. So also good works are conspicuous, and even those that are not cannot remain hidden. Don't be so hasty in selecting elders among you. Know them first. Be aware of who they are. Some people's bad character and lifestyles are obvious when you first get to know them. You see it. Oh, boy. I didn't expect that, but now I see it. Their sins go ahead of them is what we see here, verse 24. Uh, they, they, uh, the, their sins arrive before they do. Uh, they are led by their sins. And others, well, it'll take a little while to truly know who they are. But the truth eventually does come out. It's what we see in Numbers 32, 23. Your sins will find you out in due time. This is the process, my friends, I, I believe we experience when we come across a new relationship, a new friend. Right? Some of the things we see very clearly and some we see eventually. It's the same of anybody in leadership in the church of God. And then it works the other way around too. Verse 25, the last verse. Some men stand out as great leaders, as great teachers. They're good characters, very obvious. Their skill, everybody knows it. It's so obvious to everyone who sees them. Now there's a man that can be used by God. Make him the pastor. His good character is very, very obvious. And so people urge them on to serve the Lord in that capacity. There have been a few young men over the years that I have urged. Listen, consider going into ministry. Consider being a pastor. Because it was obvious that God was enabling them. Then there are those whose character and works are not so obvious. But what we discovered that is that in time... We see that this may be quiet man, maybe not even uh, outgoing man, a shy person, that he has also the ability to serve God in great ways. It's just not as obvious, but eventually that will come out too. Give him the opportunity to fulfill the calling of God, and you will see that his character is there, that his skill is there, that his ability to understand the scriptures and teach the scriptures is there. He may do it more quietly, more behind the scenes, but he's there. He's ready. Look for those people within the household of God so that they will serve. But don't be too quick to select an elder. First, you must know. Them. Jesus, friend of sinners, have strayed so far away, cut down people in your name, the sword was never ours to swing. Jesus, friend of sinners, the truth's become so hard to see, the world is on their way to you, but they're tripping over me. Always looking around, but never looking up, I'm so double minded a plank I'd save with dirty hands and a heart that's divided. Oh, Jesus, friend of sinners, open our eyes to the world at the end of our pointing fingers. Help us reach with open hearts and open doors. Oh, Jesus, friend of sinners, break our hearts for what will break yours. Jesus, friend of sinners, the one who's right.
to remember We are all the least of these Let the memory of your mercy Bring your people to the peace Nobody knows what we're for Only what we're against When we judge the wounded What if we put down our signs Crossed over the lines And love like you did Oh Jesus, friend of sinners, open our eyes to the world at the end of our pointed fingers. Let our hearts be led by mercy. Help us reach with open hearts and open doors. Every lost cause You reach for the outcast For the leper and the lame They're the reason that you came Lord, I I was that that lost cause And I was was that outcast You died for sinners just like me A grateful leper at your feet Cause you are the prayer shall we our Lord and our God we thank you because indeed you are a merciful God and you died for me you died for us and for people like us we pray Lord that we would be then more like you and that by how we live how we speak and what we say to others about you would draw their attention to you and Holy Spirit we ask that as you did for us you would do for them and save their souls May you be praised. Amen.